Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is the podcast that I have. It is my only podcast that I am doing by myself, and it is the podcast where I read the thesaurus. No, it's the dictionary. You knew that because you're smart. Um, oh, I think today is the Jewish holiday of Purim. P-U-R-I-M. What do you do on Purim? What do you do on the holiday, Purim? I don't know. I should know because uh, half my family is Jewish, but I don't know. Um, I feel like I'm talking a little bit quietly. Maybe that's because my headphones are up so loud. Whoa, that was really loud. Um, And I'm in a hotel room still. Uh, So I'm trying to be a little bit on the quiet side. Okay, that's better. Uh, Okay, the first word for this episode is barter, B-A-R-T-E-R. It is a verb from uh, the 15th century. Technically, this is the last word on page 100, but most of the definition is on page 101. Um, So, definition says... Uh, It's an intransitive definition is first. To trade by exchanging one commodity for another. Transitive definition is to trade or exchange by or as if by bartering. Barterer is a noun. And I just had dinner, uh, so I would not be surprised if I let out a good hearty burp soon. Uh, Let's see. This is from Middle English Bartren which is from Anglo-French barretaire, which means to do business or exchange. Uh, and that is an alternative of the old French barreté. And there's more at the word baratry or baratry. I think it's baratry, actually. Uh, we read that before. Okay, next is the second form of barter. I don't think I said that the other one was the first form. This is the first form. Uh, This is the second form. Oh, my brain is broken. Uh, This is a noun from the 15th century. One, the act or practice of carrying on trade by bartering. Number two, the thing given in exchange in bartering. So that was barter. Now we have Bartholin's gland. Capital B A R. T-H-O-L-I-N apostrophe S, and then the second word is gland. Uh, This is a noun from 1901. Either of two oval racemose glands lying one to each side of the lower part of the vagina and secreting a lubricating mucus compared to Cowper's gland. So I don't know if Cowper's gland, I think it might be the equivalent gland in a male I don't remember, from freshman year biology, which was, oh, I don't know, 25 years ago. Um, So sorry for the unexpected possible explicit nature of this, but it's not really explicit because it's science, so deal with that. Uh, This is from Caspar Bartholin, who died in 1738, and he, I assume, or maybe she, probably he, uh, was a Danish Danish physician who probably figured out what these glands were and what they did. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Racemos. I feel like I've come across this word before, but I don't know if that's how it's pronounced. It is spelled like race and mose. R-A-C-E-M-O-S-E. Uh, so this is something that more people should know about, don't you think? Bartholin's gland. Go look it up. Do some research. Um, next we have Bartizan, B-A-R-T-I-Z-A-N. It is a noun from 1801. A small structure as a turret projecting from a building and serving especially for lookout or defense. Uh, This is an alternative of Middle English, Bretazing. Interesting. Uh, From Brete, which means parapet. And there's more at the word Bretis. Um, I don't know how to describe that word other than to spell it for you, which is B-R-A-T-T-I-C-E. Um, I see turrets on apartment buildings sometimes, and I think that, I don't know why, it just seems like such a cool, like, childlike thing. Like, oh, I want to have my bedroom in the in the turret. It's round and it's different. And um, I think Jack Black's character actually lived in one in a, what was School of Rock. Um, I don't know. So those are kind of cool, but then... The idea of having one of those um, be for lookout or defense, 
um, you know, in just a standard apartment building seems weird. These are the things that are in my brain, people. Okay, next we have Bartlett, capital B. A-R-T-L-E-T-T. It is a noun from 1847. A pear, like the pear that you eat, uh, a pear that has yellowish green or sometimes red skin and whitish flesh and is the principal commercially produced produced pear in the U.S. Uh, this is from Enoch Bartlett, uh, who died in 1860. I don't know why it doesn't say when these people are born. Couldn't you give me their birth year and death year? Are you just trying to save ink? Why is their death year so important? Maybe I want to know what year they were born. Maybe they only lived until they were 20. That would be interesting to know. Maybe they lived to be 102. I don't know. Just saying. Uh, Enoch Bartlett was an American orchardist. I've never heard of that job, although, you know, when you think about it, it makes sense. Um, I actually just had a pear cider tonight. Uh, It was from Ace. It was Ace Perry. Okay, next we have Baruch. I think you could also say Baruch. Put the emphasis on the other syllable. Capital B-A-R-U-C-H. It is a noun from... Does it give me a year? I don't think it does. It's probably really old because it is a homolectic book included in the Roman Catholic canon of the Old Testament, see, it's old, and in the Protestant Apocrypha, see the Bible table, it tells me to do. So this is from Greek Baruch, uh, from Hebrew Baruch, B-A-R-U-K-H. Um, and I know, I think, what's the phrase? Baruch Atoy Adonai, Aloheinu Malik Alom, Asher that's funny. Anyway, uh, it, it has something to do with something. I don't. I didn't learn Hebrew. Uh, okay, next is barware. It is a noun from 1941. Glassware or utensils used in preparing and serving alcoholic beverages. Next we have baryon or baryon. Uh, this is a noun from 1953. Any of a group of subatomic particles as nucleons, that are subject to the strong force and are composed of three quarks. Baryonic is an adjective. Uh, So this is from, let's see, well, there's the scientific term bary, or the prefix bary, B-A-R-Y. He is not an actor slash hitman. From the Greek, oh, that is from the Greek baris, which means heavy, plus the suffix on, O-N, Uh, And there's more at the word grieve. And I think we've been seeing that a lot recently in the etymology. And I'm still not entirely sure why. Uh, What did I want to say about this? Okay, so there are, there's the strong force it mentioned. So there are four sort of forces in the universe. Um, I don't remember who, was it Einstein who said it? I don't know. There's the strong force, the weak force. I think those are both nuclear. The strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force. I hope I'm remembering this correctly from 20 years ago when I learned about it. Uh, gravity is one of them, of the four. And what was the other one? Oh my God, there's a mirror in front of me and I just made eye contact with myself. Um, strong force, weak force, gravity, and all of you science people are really pissed that I can't remember the fourth one. Anyway, we are going to move on to berites, B-A-R-Y-T-E-S. It could also just be berite. Uh, this is chiefly British. It is a variation of berite, B-A-R-I-T-E, uh, which we must have read before. Now we have baritone, B-A-R-Y-T-O-N-E. It is a variation of baritone with an I instead of the Y, which we definitely read before. Next we have B. BAS, B-A-S, all caps. It is an abbreviation for one, Bachelor of Applied Science. Number two, Bachelor of Arts and Sciences. Next, we have basil, B-A-S-A-L. This is not the herb basil. We'll be getting to that later. So, this is an adjective from 1645, 1A, Relating to situated at or forming the base. Now we have one B. Arising from the base of a stem. 
as in basil leaves. 2a. Of or relating to the foundation, base, or essence. Synonym is fundamental. 2b. Of, relating to, or being essential for maintaining the fundamental vital activities of an organism. Synonym is minimal, as in a basal diet. And I feel... (coughs) That was a sneeze. Um, As in a basal diet. I think I may have read that. Yeah, I think I did. 2c. Used for teaching beginners, as in basal readers. Uh, basally is an adverb. Now we have basal body, two words. It is a noun from 1902, a minute distinctively staining cell organelle found at the base of a flagellum or cilium and identical to a centriole in structure, called also basal granule or kinetosome. And wow, a lot of those words were very scientifically related. And if you didn't know what they meant, if you're not in the science world, you probably are super confused. I'm only slightly confused. Okay, next we have basal cell, two words, noun from circa 1903. One of the innermost cells of the deeper epidermis of the skin. Your epidermis is showing. Ha ha. Next we have basal ganglion. Or, or ganglion, one of them. It's not a gang lion. That's different. Uh, this is a noun from circa 1889. Any of four deeply placed masses of gray matter, as the amygdala, in each cerebral hemisphere, called also basal nucleus. Next, we have basal metabolic rate. Three separate words. Noun from 1922, the rate at which heat is given off by an organism at complete rest. Last word for this episode is basal metabolism. Two words. I hope you know how to spell it. It is a noun from 1913, the turnover of energy in a fasting and resting organism using energy solely to maintain vital cellular activity respiration, and circulation as measured by the basal metabolic rate. So basically, how much your body is burning off energy by not doing anything when you're just, you know, sitting there uh, at your base. So we are going to pick... um, Well, just to get more eyes and ears and brains on the subject matter of something that I, I'm suspecting a lot of people don't know about, we are going to pick Bartholin's gland as the word of the episode. And, um, you know, don't don't be stupid when it comes to anatomy. Learn your stuff. Uh, so that is it for this episode. I hope you have a good Purim. I should probably go look up what that is. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is your host, Spencer. Have I ever called myself the host before? I am your host, Spencer. I will be the one taking you through this journey of this very fat book called The Dictionary that gives you all the words, but this one doesn't give you all the words because it's like six years old. Uh, So whatever, we're just going to keep on using it. Oh, maybe one day I'll do, like, exclusive episodes on Patreon um, of new words. Ooh, new words. I should probably do that for the A's, actually. How many words are in here that have been added to the dictionary in the last six words? Six years. Oops. Okay. The first word for this episode is basalt. B-A-S-A-L-T. It is a noun from 1601. A dark gray to black, dense to fine-grained igneous rock that consists of basic plagioclase, augite, and usually magnetite. Uh, Yeah, those are real words. Uh, Basaltic is an adjective. This is from the Latin basaltes, which is a... uh, was M-S? Middle... could be so many different things. Uh, Manuscript. Ooh. That was not what I was expecting. Uh, So this is, uh, where did it go? Basalt. Uh, Manuscript variation of basanites, basanites, uh, which means touchstone, from the Greek basanites, 
uh, or which is lithos. Lithos is still in italics and it's in parentheses, so I don't know what that means. Uh, from basanos, which means touchstone, from the Egyptian word, oh boy, I don't know Egyptian, B-H-N-W. How would you think to pronounce that word? I have a laptop in front of me. Um, maybe I'll go look it up. Maybe I won't. I don't know. I've been up for many hours. My voice is a little raspy, so apologies. Maybe it's maybe it's sexy. Maybe you like it. I don't know. Okay, the next word is bascule. B-A-S-C-U-L-E. This is a noun from 1678. An apparatus or structure, as a drawbridge, in which one end is counterbalanced by the other on the principle of the seesaw or by weights. Uh, and, oh, it, this is, a, it's a French word, bascule, and it means seesaw. Seesaw. All right, now we have the bulk of this episode. It is the word base, B-A-S-E. This is the first form, and uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, we're just going to go read all of these definitions, because there's a bunch of them. I should probably use my finger to keep my place, because I tend to get lost on things like this. Okay, this is a noun from the 13th century. 1A1, the lower part of a wall, pier, or column, considered as a separate architectural feature. 1A2, the lower part of a complete architectural design. 1B, the bottom of something considered as its support. Synonym is foundation. 1C1, a side or face of a geometrical figure from which an altitude can be constructed, especially one on which the figure stands. Uh, Let's see, now we are in 1C2. It's kind of hard to keep track. The length of a base. 1D, that part of a bodily organ. Yeah, it starts with that. That part of a bodily organ by which it is attached to another more central structure of the organism. 2A. A main ingredient, as in paint having a latex base. 2B. A supporting or carrying ingredient, as of a medicine. 3A. The fundamental part of something. Synonyms are groundwork and basis. 3B. The economic factors on which, in Marxist theory, all legal, social, and political relations are formed. Number four, the lower part of a heraldic field. 5A, the starting point or line for an action or undertaking. 5B, a baseline in surveying. 5C, a center or area in operations, as 5C1 the place from which a military force draws supplies. 5C2, a place where military operations begin. 5C3, a permanent military installation. 5D1, a number, uh, I'm going to skip the part part in parentheses for now, a number that is raised to a power, especially the number that when raised to a power equal to the logarithm of a number, yields the number itself. Okay, so the part in parentheses was as the number 5 in 5 to the 6.44 power. Why they had to make it 6.44, I don't know. Or also 5 to the 7th power. So the 5 is the base. Okay, as in, we have an example, even though we just had an example. Uh, We have an example. The logarithm of 100 to the base 10 is 2 since 10 to the second power equals 100. Uh, Logarithms can be weird and complicated, but they can also be super simple when you actually understand how they work. Uh, Yeah, okay. Moving on to, oh, what are we on? 5D2, I think. A number equal to the number of units in a given digit's place that, for a given system of writing numbers, is required to give the numeral 1 in the next higher place. As in, the decimal system uses a base of 10. Also, such a system of writing numbers using an indicated base. As in, convert from base 10 to base 2. 5 
5D2, no, 5D3 is next. Oh, this is getting complicated. A number that is multiplied by a rate or of which a percentage or fraction is calculated. As in, to find the interest on $90 at 10%, multiply the base 9 by 0 0.10. Wow, that was kind of a long example. Now we have uh, 5E. We just have the number six definition for the word root, R-O-O-T. Stephen Root is a fantastic actor. It's my stapler. That's terrible. Okay, 6A. The starting place or goal in various games. 6B. Any one of the four stations at the corners of a baseball infield. Uh, 6C. Did I say 6B last? I don't know. I might have said 5B. It was 6B. This one is 6C. A point to be considered. As in, his opening remarks touched every base. 7A. Any of various typically water-soluble and bitter-tasting compounds that in solution have a pH greater than 7 are capable of reacting with an acid to form a salt and are molecules or ions able to take up a proton from an acid or able to give up an unshared pair of electrons to an acid. Oh, that was a long definition. One, two, three, four lines. 7B. Any of the five purine or pyrimidine bases of DNA and RNA that include cytosine, guanine, uh, adenine, thymine, and uracil. 8. A price level at which a security previously declining in price resists further decline. Number 9, and I think this is the last official definition the part of a transformational grammar that consists of rules and a lexicon and generates the deep structures of a language. Based, with an ed at the end, is an adjective. Baseless is an adjective. Off base is a whole new phrase that now has two definitions. The first one has the synonyms wrong and mistaken, as in estimates were way off base. And the number two definition for off-base has the synonym unawares, and as in, caught off-base by the charges. Now we are at the last word of this episode. It is the word base again. It is the second form, tra uh, transitive verb from 1587. One, to make, form, or serve as a base for. Number two, to find a base or basis for, usually used with the word on or upon. And we are going to pick bascule as the word of the episode because it means seesaw. And um, that's, I think, all I got to say about that. I'm super tired, so I think I'm going to go to bed soon. Um, and so uh, what, what was I going to say? Um, and until next time, um, this is uh, Spencer dispensing words to your brains. I don't know. Maybe I'll work on that and come up with something better later. Okay. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. I'm so glad you're here. We are going to have a little bit of a party. Uh, yeah. First word is base. B-A-S-E. It is an adjective from the 14th century. One is archaic. Of little height. Number two is obsolete. Low in place or position. And let's turn down the microphone just a tad. Uh, number three is also obsolete. And we have the synonym base spelled B-A-S-S. -S. Uh, so the main word is B-A-S-E. I could also say the base word is B-A-S-E. Number four, also archaic. Synonym is baseborn. All one word. 5A, resembling a... Well, now this is interesting. I thought it was the word villain, uh, but it it looks like it's villain. V-I-L-L-E-I-N. I am not familiar with this word. Resembling a villain. And a synonym is servile, as in a base tenant, like the tenant who lives in an apartment building. 5B, held by villainage. There's uh, another form of that word, as in base tenure. 6A, being of comparatively low value and having relatively inferior properties as lack of resistance to corrosion, as in a base metal such as iron. And then it says compared to the word noble, N-O-B-L-E. Yeah, I've also heard uh, noble metals or noble 
um, uh, noble. I'm trying to think like the on the periodic table, noble something. I don't know. Anyway, we're going to move on to 6B, containing a larger than usual proportion of base metals, as in base silver denarii. That is D E N A R I I. Don't know what it is. Maybe it's a piece of money? Number 7A, lacking or indicating the lack of higher qualities of mind or spirit. And a synonym is ignoble. Oh, boy, boy. Ignoble. That reminds me of uh, when I tried to say, or when I said the uh, this one phrase backwards, ignomamaya, imtakul, uh, which is, of course, as everybody knows, look at me, I am a monkey. Anyway, it's ignom. Oh, now I can't even say it. Ignoble. I G N O B L E. So it's interesting that one of these definitions has the synonym noble, and the other one has the synonym ignoble. And are they same, similar, opposites? I don't know. Uh, so that's kind of interesting to me. Uh, now we are on 7B, lacking higher values. Synonym is degrading, as in a drab, base way of life. Basely is an adverb, and baseness is a noun. And now we are going to read some synonym information for the word base. Did I say this is the third form of base? The other two were at the end of the last episode. Okay, base, low, vile, mean deserving of contempt because of the absence of higher values. Base stresses the ignoble and may suggest... I'm losing my place. And may suggest cruelty, treachery, greed, or grossness, as in base motives. Low may connote crafty cunning, vulgarity, or immorality, and regularly implies an outraging of one's sense of decency or propriety, as in refused to listen to such low talk. Low talk. Vile, the strongest of these words, tends to suggest disgusting depravity or filth, as in a vile remark. Now we have base angle, two words. It is a noun from circa 1949. Either of the angles of a triangle that have one side in common with the base. Baseball is next. Uh, It is a noun from circa 1815. Did you know that that word was that old? Because I didn't. A game played, played, a game played with a bat and ball between two teams of nine players each on a large field having four bases that mark the course a runner must take to score. Also, the ball used in this game. I have a couple things that I want to mention, but I'm going to save them for the episode, uh, the end of the episode, but I'm afraid I'm going to forget. Uh, so remember that and something else that I've already forgotten. Next is baseball cap. Uh, This is a noun from 1944, a cap of the kind worn by baseball players that has a rounded crown and a long visor. I do not look good in baseball caps, probably just hats in general. I put them on and I just think I look pretty stupid, so I do not wear baseball caps. Next is base board, all one word. It is a noun from 1847, a board situated at or forming the base of something. Specifically, a molding covering the joint of a wall and the adjoining floor. Next is base born, one word. This was the synonym for um, the four, the number four definition of the first word of this episode. Uh, and it's archaic. So base born is an adjective from 1591. Number one, synonyms are mean, M-E-A-N, and my favorite word of the episode, ignoble. Um, It's funny that I don't think anybody else has this, but in my brain, when a word starts with igno, this might be the only one, I want to say that backwards phrase. My, My mouth is trained to do that. And so it's actually really hard for me to say ignoble. Um, Anyway, 2A, a humble birth. And 2B, of illegitimate birth. So humble birth of illegitimate birth, similar, different, interesting. Next, we have base exchange, two words, noun from circa 1956, a post exchange at a naval or air force debate, air force base, not air forced. Now we have base hit, 
two words. It is a noun from 1847, a hit in baseball that enables the batter to reach base safely without benefit of an error or fielder's choice. Now we have base jumping. Ah, so this is interesting. I am going to learn something, and I hope you are too. So base is all caps, B-A-S-E, all caps. Um, I, I didn't really ever know. That's not a correct phrase. That's not how you say it. I never really knew where this uh, phrase comes from. Why do they use the word base? I always sort of thought um, you're jumping from a base of some kind, like a platform. Um, but let me read this to you. It is a noun from 1982. The activity or sport of parachuting from a high structure as a building, tower, or bridge, or cliff. And base jumper is a noun. So the etymology says that the uh, base is an acronym. I think that's the right word, acronym. For B for building, A for antenna, S for span, and E for earth. So what? How? So, um, yeah. What? Building? You jump off a building? Maybe you climb onto an antenna? You fall the span from that distance to the earth? I am so confused. I should look into this more. Why do they have the word base? Why is base an acronym for those four words? What, where, why did they put those four words together? I don't know. If you're a base jumper, why don't you give me a phone call the, or uh, contact me? The, all of the information is in the episode description. You all should know that. Uh, let me know. Give me some more information. I might go to Wikipedia too. Next is baseline, all one word. Uh, it is a noun from 1610. One, a line serving as a basis, especially one of known measure or position used, as in surveying or navigation, to calculate or locate something. So without the parentheses, um, after the especially, it says one of known measure or position used to calculate or locate something. Much more simple. 2A, either of the lines on a baseball field that lead from home plate to first base and third base and are extended into the outfield as foul lines. They call them baselines. Now we have 2B. Synonym is base path. So I think that's essentially the same thing as the, the baseball definition, but they also are called base path. Number three, a boundary line at either end of a court, as in tennis or basketball. Number four. Oh, you know what? They should have a... We've already passed it, but they should have basketball in here now, why isn't oh that's because it's spelled differently yeah did you ever see the movie basketball from the guys who make south park uh it's funny it is very adult uh, but that should be in here four a usually initial set of critical observations or data used for comparison or a control number five a starting point as in the baseline of this discussion Next is base liner, all one word. It is a noun from circa 1929, a tennis player who stays on or near the baseline and seldom moves to the net. Next and last word for this episode is basement, noun from 1613. One, the part of a building that is wholly or partly below ground level. Two, the ground floor facade or interior in Renaissance architecture. Number three, the lowest or fundamental part of something, specifically the rocks underlying stratified rocks. Wait, what? The rocks underlying stratified rocks. Number four is chiefly from New England, a toilet or washroom, especially in a school. Seriously? In New England, they call bathrooms basements? That's so fascinating. It can't be all people. Weird. Okay, basementless is an adjective. I have never heard anybody use that word. Um, and this says it's probably from the first form of the word base, which was in the last episode, which is the one that had a gazillion definitions. Um, it's funny. I actually never really thought about where the word basement came from. Um, clearly, the prefix base, it's like it's the base level of a building. Um, what do you use? Do you say basement or do you say cellar? Um, maybe I should put up like a Twitter or Instagram poll just because that's a fun thing to do, right? People do that stuff. 
Um, I've always said basement. I know some people say cellar, but they're the same thing. Uh, all right, what is the word of the episode? I think I am going to pick base jumping as the word of the episode because I was super blown away by the fact that base is an acronym. I didn't know that. All right, so what do I got to say? Uh, first of all, uh, a friend of mine told me that his friend actually listens to this podcast. So if your name is Charlie, I am giving you a shout out. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I, I'm always blown away by anybody who actually listens to this on a regular basis. I think there's maybe an average of 55 or 60 people uh, who download this regularly, and all of you people are awesome, and all of you new people are awesome. And uh, so that's very cool. Charlie, thank you. Uh, I think he said that you listen in your car with your kids or something. Uh, so hi, kids. I don't know your names, but you probably don't want me to say your names anyway. And uh, keep on listening. Thank you. Uh, let's see. What else do I got to say? Uh, ba ba ba. Please leave a review on Apple. Give me constructive criticism if you want. Uh, just, you know, send this stuff around. Join the Patreon. Oh, that was the other thing. I uh, I put up another exclusive episode. It is the first of maybe four exclusive episodes of bloopers from when I was reading the letter A, when I was actually doing editing. Um, I was going to edit them all into one piece, but I was having trouble with that, and I didn't really want to put any more brain effort into it. So I sort of broke it up into into uh, uh, sections, styles, types, whatever you want to call it. So the first one is just normal bloopers. Um, there are a bunch of swear words. Um, I think most of them are pretty funny. Um, I still get a kick out of it when I listen to them, uh, and maybe you will too. So if you want to get, uh, if you want to hear those, you have to give me five dollars a month. Nah, nah. Um, and then there's some other funny bloopers that are coming up as well. Uh, let's see. I think that is it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to me talk. Um, I I like this podcast. I am going to keep on doing it, even if it's just for myself. Um, it's sometimes kind of fun to just talk into a microphone by myself. But uh, I do want to have some guests soon, so uh, maybe I'll get those at some point. Anyway, I'm going to end this episode. Um, this has been Spencer dispensing information into your brain. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary Podcast. I am so excited that you are here. We are going to have so much fun today. Let's talk about some words. The first word is basement membrane. B-A-S-E-M-E-N-T. Second word, M-E-M-B-R-A-N-E. This is a noun from 1847. A thin membranous... I'm still not sure. Membr oh, membranous. I think that's how you say it. A thin membranous layer of connective tissue that separates a layer of epithelial cells from the underlying lamia or lamina propia. Whoa, there are words I don't know here. A thin, membranous layer of connective tissue that separates a layer of epithelial cells from the underlying lamina propia. So you people who know your cells know this stuff. Now we have basenji. B-A-S-E-N-J-I. It is a noun from 1937. Any of a breed of small, curly-tailed dogs of African origin that do not bark? What? They don't bark. Why don't they bark? Can they not bark? Do they choose not to bark? Have the African people trained them generation after generation to keep their mouths shut? I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, at this point, they're probably just used to it, but I don't know. I feel like dogs should need to bark sometimes, right? Granted, some dogs bark too much, and that is frustrating. Uh, basenji. So this is probably modified of the Lingala word, M B W A. Whoa, there's multiple words. Okay, first word is M B W A. Mubwa. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Second word is N A. And then the third word is Basenji. Uh, li and it literally means dogs of the bushland people. That's cool. I didn't know about these dogs. I don't know about a lot of dogs, actually. All right, next we have Base on Balls. Three words from 1884. An advance to first base awarded a baseball player who, during a turn at bat, takes four pitches that are balls. So I hope you, most of you know enough about baseball that if you are at bat and you get four balls, 
you go to first base. So that is called a base on balls. Next is base pair. It is hyphenated. It is an intransitive verb from 1973 to participate in formation of a base pair, um, as in adenine base pairs with thymine, and that's talking about DNA. If you want to know more, go look up DNA. Now we have base pair again, but there is no hyphen. It is a no- it's just two words. Uh, it is a noun from 1956. One of the pairs of nucleotide bases on complementary strands of nucleic acid that consist of a purine on one strand joined to a pyrimidine, pyrimidine on the other strand by hydrogen bonds holding together the two strands much like the rungs of a ladder and that include adenine linked to thymine or thymine thymine in dna or to uracil in rna and guanine linked to cytosine in both dna and rna oh my god that was a mouthful next we have base path it is two words noun from 1935 the area between the bases of a baseball field used by a base runner next is base pay two words noun from 1920 a rate or amount of pay for a standard work period job or position exclusive of additional payments or allowances next is base plate one word Noun from 1876, a plate that serves as a base or support. Next is base runner. Two words. Noun from 1867, a baseball player of the team at bat who is on base or is attempting to reach a base. Base running is a noun. Now we have the word bases. B-A-S-E-S. It is plural of the word base, B-A-S-E, or of the word basis so it's uh b-a-s-i-s so it could be plural of basis or base you gotta look at your context people now we have the word bash b-a-s-h it is uh the first form it's a verb from 1750 and we are going to start with the transitive definitions one to strike violently and just as a reminder this is partly for myself that a a transitive verb is um, about the person or the object that is doing the verb, doing the action. So one is to strike violently. Synonym is hit. Also, to injure or damage by striking. Synonym is smash. Often used with the word in, I-N. Number two, to attack physically or verbally. As in media bashing. Also as in celebrity bashing. Now we have the intransitive verb definition, and so the opposite, obviously, would be this is the thing, the verb is happening to the thing, um, and the synonym is crash. Basher is a noun. The origin of this word is unknown, by the way. Uh, Now we have the second form of bash. It is a noun from 1805. One, a forceful blow. Two, a festive social gathering. Synonym is party. We're going to bash like it's 1999. See, it doesn't have the same ring. Number three is chiefly British. Uh, Synonyms are try and attempt, as in have a bash at it. Now we have a word I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce. It is either probably bashaw or bashaw. B-A-S-H-A-W. And it is a variation of the word pasha. P-A-S-H-A. Now we have bashful. Hey, quick fun fact. Uh, Do you know the seven dwarfs? The names of the seven dwarfs. A lot of people have trouble with this, but there's a trick. And uh, I haven't thought about this for a while, so let me see if I can remember. Well, there's seven of them. Um, Oh, shoot. You know what? This is not going to work. It's something like three of them are emotions and three of them are like actions or whatever. And then one of them is something else. I could think I could name them, but, well, maybe I should just do that. Okay, we've got Doc, and Dopey, and Bashful, and Sleepy, and Grumpy, and Happy, and one more. Did I say Bashful? I think I did. Uh, well, I always uh, felt akin to Dopey. Okay, Bashful is an adjective from 1548. One, socially shy or timid. Synonym is diffident 
or self-conscious. Number two, resulting from or typical of a bashful nature, as in a bashful smile. And I really want to think of the seventh one, and I know a lot of you are screaming at me at me right now. Doc, dopey, doc, dopey, grumpy, happy, bad. Oh, st- oh, sneezy. Duh. Uh, okay. Number two, resulting from or did I, I already read that one? Synonym is the word shy. Bashfully is an adverb, and bashfulness is a noun. And this is uh, the etymology obsolete bash, which means to be abashed. Okay, now we have the word basic. It is the first form adjective from 1842. 1A, of relating to or forming the base or essence. Synonym is fundamental, as in basic truths. I like basic truths. You could call them facts. A lot of people are not aware or don't really care about basic truths. 1B, Concerned with fundamental scientific principles not applied. That is a, a sort of a next section of the definition after a colon. As in, basic research. Number two, constituting or serving as the basis or starting point. As in, a basic set of tools. I like this word. 3A, of relating to containing or having the character of a chemical base. 3B, having an alkaline reaction. Four, containing relatively little silica, as in basic rocks. Number five, relating to made by, used in, or being a process of making steel done in a furnace lined with basic material and under basic slag. As in, uh, no, another word is, oh, so this is interesting. All right, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Basicity. Basicity is a noun. So what I was going to say about why that word is interesting, because that is the word that is at the top of the page that says what the last word of the page is. But it is not the last word on the page. In fact, it's not even one of the basic words. It is another form of a basic word. We still have three words on this page. What are you doing to me, dictionary? Come on. Okay. Basic. Now we have the second form of basic. It is a noun from 1926. One, something that is basic. Uh, Synonym is fundamental. As in, get back to basics. Number two, synonym is basic training. Now we have basic again, but this is all caps. B-A-S-I-C, all caps. It is a noun from 1964. A simplified high-level language for programming a computer. And BASIC is an acronym that stands for Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. All right, last word for this episode is basically B-A-S-I-C-A-L-L-Y. And I'm going to have to do a page flip. This is an adverb from 1903. 1A, at a basic level, colon, in fundamental disposition or nature, as in basically correct, also as in basically they are simple people i'm uh i'm feeling a little bit more comfortable to let out my burps i apologize if somebody if some of you really really hate burps uh but you know it's gas in the body and it's got to be let out somehow and if i don't let it out i'm gonna sound stupid so i'm just letting it out and i'm not editing it out so sorry deal with it but for the rest of you i hope you get a little chuckle every time it happens one b for the most part as in They basically play zone defense. Number two, in a basic manner. Synonym is simply, as in live basically. All right, what is the word of the episode? Um, There was nothing really... Well, I'm going to pick Basenji as the word of the episode because I didn't know about these dogs and I want to learn more about them. Um, I also, as a a runner-up, would be just the word basic because... Um, I liked those first few definitions about basic truths. I mean, that's an example, not a definition, but basic truths and fundamental scientific principles and all that stuff. I I like that. I appreciated that. I think we are getting away from the basics. Um, All right. That is that is all the words I'm going to read to you from the dictionary. I feel like I want to say some stuff, but I can't remember what I was going to say. 
Tomorrow night, I'm going to see They Might Be Giants. I think I mentioned that before. Um, actually, the other time I mentioned it was in the episode that aired tomorrow. Oh, that was a weird phrase. Uh, but I still haven't... Uh, tomorrow hasn't happened yet. So it's. But it, it has happened in your world, just not in mine currently, right now. But later it has. So after the show, when I record, I'll tell you how it was. Um, I think I'm going to go see Onward tomorrow before the show. Uh, that is the new Pixar movie. I, 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 I think most of you love Pixar movies and stuff. Um, I know maybe I pro- I'm almost forty years old and I'm gonna go by myself and I don't really care because they make great movies. They are definitely kid friendly and family movies, but I also really like some kid friendly family movies. Uh, I'm I'm trusting that they are gonna do a good job, just like most of the rest of their movies. I'm trying not to have high hopes. Um, but at the very least, it looks like it's visually beautiful. So that's cool. And then they're coming out with another movie. I don't know if it's later this year or next year. All I've seen is the poster. That's all I want to see. And it's called Soul. And it's a picture of an African-American man and like piano keys in this really artistic way. And just from that, I am so sold. And the fact that it's Pixar, I am really, really interested interested to see what this film is about and what they're going to do with that uh that concept i feel like the opportunities to make something amazing are just endless and uh i'm i really hope it doesn't disappoint but i don't really think they can uh with something like that uh like jazz music and just music in general and like what's this guy's story i don't know i'm super into that um I've been super busy with work the last four days, so I haven't watched any, like, new shows or anything. Um, I've barely even gotten enough sleep. Um, So that's where I'm going to end this episode. This has been Dispenser Dispensing... What's my name? This has been Spencer Dispensing Information to Your Brains. I hope you have enjoyed this. Uh, Please go do the stuff and the things, and uh, be nice, and be happy, and I love you guys. Okay, bye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary Podcast. I am so glad you've joined me for yet another episode. Yes, these are coming to your ear holes every single day. What? Yeah. It's one of those daily podcasts. I guess I should, um, maybe I should put in the description daily podcast so it'll actually come up when people are looking for daily podcasts. But nobody knows that this exists, so it's not going to come up. First is basic slag. B-A-S-I-C. Second word, S-L-A-G. It is a noun from 1869. A slag low in silica and high in basic form, no, base forming oxi, ox, oh geez, I'm screwing this up so bad. Oxides. Let's start this over. A slag low in silica and high in base forming oxides that is used in the basic process of steel making and that is subsequently useful as a fertilizer. Now we have basic training, noun from 1943, the initial period of training of a military recruit. So before the almost the end of World War II, they didn't have basic training? Or maybe they just didn't call it basic training. What did they call it? I don't know. Now we have basidiomycete. Uh, this reminds me of a... Um, Uh, One of the short little pieces in my bloopers episode, which is um, in my Patreon, if you want to become a $5 member, please go give me $5 a month and you can get exclusive episodes, including the current two exclusive episodes. And one of those is a blooper episodes where I, oh, actually, no, it's not up in this one. It'll be up in another one uh, where I, for some reason, say the word basidiomycetes. Maybe it was a, a synonym or something. I don't know. Anyway, this is basidiomycete, B-A-S-I-D-I-O-M-Y-C-E-T-E. It is a noun from 1899, any of a group of higher fungi that have septate hyphae and spores born on a basidium that include rusts, smuts, mushrooms, and puffballs, and that are variously considered to comprise a class, a subdivision, or a division. Oh, boy. All right. So what do I have to say? So they include rusts, smuts, mushrooms, and puffballs. That sounds like something from Willy Wonka or funny character names. I don't know. Rusts and smuts. 
Uh, let's see. They also so there are various. Um, there was the class Basidiomycetes. The subdivision is Basidiomycotina, and the division is Basidiomycota. And then Basidiomycetes is an adjective. This is from the New Latin Basidium plus the Greek mycet or mykes, which means fungus. It is akin to the Greek mixa, which means mucus. Mm. And there's more at the word mucus. I bet all of you love that word. Now we have basidiospore. It is a noun from 1859. A spore produced by a basidium. This reminds me that there's a new uh, documentary. Is it called Fantastic Fungi? I think it might be. Um... I heard that it was in a very small movie theater near me, and I really wanted to go see it, and I didn't get a chance, and I'm sure it's not there anymore. But I saw a trailer for it, uh, and it looks absolutely beautiful and fascinating, and fungi are amazing. And I probably already talked about that on this podcast. I can't remember. Um, All right, next we have Basidium. It is a noun from 1859. A structure on a Basidiomycete in which... Karyogami occurs followed by meiosis to form usually four basidiospores. A structure on a basidiomycete in which karyogami, K-A-R-Y-O-G-A-M-Y, in which karyogami occurs followed by meiosis to form usually four basidiospores. Next is basify. It is a verb from circa 1849. Transitive definition. That's the only one we got. To convert into a base or make alkaline. Basification is a noun. Now we have basil. B-A-S-I-L. It is a noun from the 15th century. One, any of several aromatic herbs of the mint family, especially the synonym sweet basil. And the genus for the aromatic herb is osimum or okimum. It is O-C-I-M-U-M. I know usually when an I is after a C, it's an S sound, but sometimes in Latin it's not. Okimum? I don't know. Uh, All right, number two. The dried or fresh leaves of a basil used especially as a seasoning. Uh, All right, next we have basilar or could but. Could also be basilar, could also be basilar, B-A-S-I-L-A-R. It is an adjective from 1541 of relating to or situated at the base. Uh, This is Middle French, basilar, which is an irregular form of base or bez, which means base. Now we have basilar membrane, two words, noun from 1867. A membrane extending from the bony shelf of the cochlea to the outer wall and supporting the organ of corti, or corti. Uh, Well, the cochlea is in the ear, so this is in the ear. Uh, A membrane extending from the bony shelf of the cochlea to the outer wall and supporting the organ of corti, or corti. I don't know what the organ of corti is, or corti, uh, so I I don't know. Uh, Okay, by the way... um, I just thought of this because I scratched my eyelid. Um, there's there's some there's some virusy stuff going around in the world, and uh, I guess this is now as good a time as any. Make sure you wash your hands. Make sure that you are clean. Make sure you, if you cough. See, here's the thing. Uh, these are things that I'm saying specifically now because of the coronavirus that's going around. Why I'm talking about this in the middle of an episode, I don't know, uh, but. These are things that people should be doing anyway every single day. These are things that a lot of people do not do, do not think about. Uh, so I guess it's just this is just an excuse for me to talk about this and for hopefully people to get clean. But I'll make this quick. Uh, when you sneeze or cough, uh, do it into a some sort of thing or into your elbow or onto the ground. Uh, People are very bad when they're sneezing and coughing. They just go right out into the air or they do it in their hand. That is terrible. Or if you're going to do that, go wash your hands immediately. Every time you blow your nose, wash your hands. I don't care if you don't think it got through the Kleenex. It probably did. Go wash your hands. Wash your hands with soap every single time. 
after you go to the bathroom, wash your hands with soap. I don't want to sound like some weird germaphobe, but seriously, the 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 way germs are hand washing is the easiest and most effective thing people can do to stop the spread of germs. Why aren't people doing this? It's crazy. Be conscious of where your particles are flying. All right, sorry, I had just had to get that off my chest. Um, okay, we are on b- bas- Basilian. Uh, it's like, okay, capital B-A-S-I-L-I-A-N. It is a noun from 1780. Also, when you come from outside, if you've been touching things, wash your hands. Uh, I, gotta, I gotta be honest here, I was bad. I learned a lot about this from my wife, and I have, I still could be better, but like, man, the things that you touch every day that are just covered in nasty stuff is mind-boggling. When you start to think about it, you will start to wash your hands more. Don't, don't touch your eyes. Don't chew your pen, which I do. Don't, don't bite your fingers. Don't, uh, just be smart, man. All right, sorry. Bazillion, capital B A S I L I A N. It is. It's like a reptilian made out of basil. I don't know. It's a noun from 1780. A member of the monastic order founded by Saint Basil in the fourth century in Cappadocia. I'm. I'm gonna just say that's how it's pronounced. And bazillion is an adjective. Now we have basilica. It is a noun from 1541. One. An oblong building ending in a semicircular apse used... That's not the apse on your phone. It is A-P-S-E. A semicircular apse used in ancient Rome, especially for a court of justice and place of public assembly. Number two, an early Christian church building... Sorry. An early Christian church building consisting of nave and aisles with... Clerostery or clerestory and a large high transept. God, I don't know some of these words. Uh, from which an apse projects. Number three, a Roman Catholic church given ceremonial privileges. Basilican is an adjective. Uh, this is Latin from Greek basiliki, from the feminine of basilikos, which means royal, from basilius, which means king. Okay, now we have basilisk, B-A-S-I-L-I-S-K. It is the first form. It is a noun from the 14th century. One, a legendary reptile with fatal breath, oh, fatal breath, and glance. What? Oh, legendary. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. A legendary reptile with fatal breath and glance. Number two, any of several crested tropical American lizards, Related to the iguanas and noted for their ability to run on their hind legs. Yeah, that's scary. Uh, Okay, so the genus name is Basilicus of the family Iguanidae. Um, We don't need to say the etymology. Maybe I can find a picture of this legendary reptile with fatal breath and glance. It just looks at you and you die. Now we have the second form of basilisk. It is um, our last word of this episode. It is an adjective from 1821, suggesting a basilisk. Synonyms are baleful and spellbinding, as in the eyes with all their blaze of basilisk horror. And that is from Bram Stoker. I'm assuming it is from Dracula, maybe? Uh, but I maybe I will uh, have some time to look up where that is from. Okay, there's some good words in here, um, but I need to pick one of them as the word of the episode. Um, Basidiomycete is good, uh, all the fungi and stuff, but I'm going to pick basilisk, specifically the legendary reptile, as the word of the episode. Um, uh, Let's see, today is Pi Day. Do you know what Pi Day is? Uh, I'm specifically talking to you kids. Uh, You can eat pie. I would fully support that. Um, but specifically, it is pi the number, 3.1415 something, 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 and goes on forever. Also, it is Albert Einstein's birthday. I think it was his birthday or his death day. I don't remember, actually. I thought it was his birthday. Um, so, yeah, celebrate Einstein, celebrate pi, which, if you don't know what it is, go look it up. It's a very um, important number in the math of nature. Would that be a good way to say it? 
uh, circles specifically. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I got. Thank you. And uh, this has been Spencer Dispensing Knowledge. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Today is March 15th, which I believe is called the Ides of March. Uh, So the Ides in old sort of Latin Roman culture or whatever um, is the 15th of the month. Um, So there's the Ides of April, which would be tax day. There's the Ides of June, which would be the 15th of June. Anyway, uh, supposedly, what is the story? That somebody said to Caesar, beware the Ides of March... And then he got killed on March 15th. Is that right? Um, That's all I got to say about that. The first word is basin. B-A-S-I-N. It is a noun from the 13th century. 1A. An open, usually circular vessel with sloping or curving sides used typically for holding water for washing. 1B. Is chiefly British. A bowl used especially in cooking. 1C. The quantity contained in a basin. 2A. A dock built in a tidal river or harbor. 2B. An enclosed or partly enclosed water area. 3A. A large or small depression in the surface of the land or in the ocean floor. 3B. The entire tract of country drained by a river and its tributaries. 3C. A great depression in the surface of the lithosphere occupied by an ocean. 4. A broad area of the earth beneath which the strata dip usually from the sides toward the center. And uh, basinal is an adjective. Basined is an adjective. And basinful is a noun. And of course that all depends on the context of which definition you are talking about. Now we have uh, bassinet. It is a noun from the 14th century. One. Nope, not one. Just the only one. One is the loneliest number. That you... A light, typically pointed steel helmet, often having a visor. Uh, that's a bassinet. Uh, okay. Now we have basipital. B-A-S-I-P-E-T-A-L. It is an adjective from 1869. Proceeding from the apex toward the base or from above downward. Okay? Uh, As in, basipital maturation of an inflorescence. What? Of an inflorescence. Basipital maturation of an inflorescence. I don't know what that says. Uh, Basipitally is an adverb. Uh, This is Latin from basis plus patere, which means to go toward. And there's more at the word feather. Uh, so I don't know what basis means in Latin. I probably learned that somewhere, uh, but I think it's I think it's just like the base. So where were we to go toward the base? Oh, to go down, proceeding from the apex toward. Yeah, so it goes. Yeah, that's what the definition said. Proceeding from the apex from the top toward the base, which is the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Now we have basis. It is a noun from the 14th century. One. The bottom of something considered at its foundation. Number two, the principal component of something. 3A, something on which something else is established or based. 3B, an underlying condition or state of affairs, as in hired on a trial basis. Also as in on a first name basis. Number four, the basic principle. Five, A set of linearly independent vectors in a vector space such that any vector in the vector space can be expressed as a linear combination of them with appropriately chosen coefficients. That's how I feel. Yep, you you got it. Uh, Now we have basis point, two words, noun from 1967, one hundredth of 1%, as in the yield of an investment. Uh, So one hundredth of 1%. Uh, so 1% is 100th of the whole thing, and then 100th of that. So would that be like 10,000th of the whole thing? A basis point. Interesting. Uh, okay, so next we have Basque. B-A-S-K. It is a verb from the 14th century. First, we have the intransitive definitions. One, to lie or relax in a pleasant warmth or atmosphere. And... Oh boy, I can't tell you how much I just want to bask right now. 
maybe on a beach in the sun with the waves splashing. That would be so wonderful right now. Number two, to take pleasure or derive enjoyment, as in basked in the spotlight. Uh, Now we have the one transitive definition. It is obsolete. To warm by continued exposure to heat. Uh, Let's see. This is Middle English, probably from the Old Norse bathask, B-A-T-H-A-S-K, which is a, I think that's saying it's reflective. What, What is that exactly? Hold on. Let's look at this. Yeah, you can probably hear the microphone moving and the pages moving. Uh, yeah, reflexive. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure what that means in terms of grammar and words and stuff. Uh, but it is a reflexive of the word batha, which means to bathe, and it is akin to the Old English bath, b-a-e-t-h, which means bath. Now we have basket. It is a noun from the 14th century. 1A, a receptacle made of interwoven material as osiers or osiers. I don't know what that is. O-S-I-E-R-S. 1B, any of various lightweight, usually wood containers. Uh, This is just a silly thing to say, but um, my wife and I joke a lot about how much she loves baskets. She loves things baskets that you can put stuff in and we i just like to make fun of her about that uh one c the quantity contained in a basket number two something that resembles a basket especially in shape or use three a a net open at the bottom and suspended from a metal ring that constitutes the goal in basketball three b a field goal in basketball four a an aggregate of values as of selected currencies, the average of which serves as a monetary standard. 4b, a selection of financial instruments as equities, futures, or options, the values of which reflect market fluctuations. 5, a ring around the lower end of a ski pole that keeps the pole from sinking too deep in snow. Basket-like is an adjective. Uh, Let's see, this is Middle English from Anglo-French, akin to Old French, Bascou, B-A-S-C-H-O-U-E. I'm sure a lot of you uh, love hearing me mispronounce these words, especially the French ones. Um, uh, Bascou means wooden vessel. Uh, Both of those, both of what? Both? I don't know. Both are from the Latin bascuada, which means kind of basin, of Celtic origin, akin to the Middle Irish Basque, B-A-S-C, which means necklace. Okay, and there's more at the word fascia. Okay, F-A-S-C-I-A. Now we have basketball. Uh, This is a noun from 1892. 1892? A usually indoor court game between two teams of usually five players each who score by tossing an inflated ball through a raised goal. Also, the ball used in this game. I'm going to sing a little song here that some of you might be familiar with and some of you might not be. I think it's from Cheech and Chong. Did they write it or did somebody else write it? I don't know. I got a basketball Jones. I got a basketball Jones. I got a basketball Jones. Ooh, baby. Ooh. Uh, you kids shouldn't go listen to it, but you adults should go find that uh from Cheech and Chong and lots of their other stuff because they are hilarious okay now we have basketballer it is a noun from 1928 a basketball player next is basket case two words noun from 1919 one a person who has all four limbs amputated they call that a basket case seriously where did that come from why did they why can you, because you can fit them in a basket case? What? Why? Oh, I got to look that, that up. Okay, number two, a person who is mentally incapacitated or worn out, as from nervous tension. Also, one that is not functioning well or is in a rundown condition, as in an economic basket case. Sometimes I feel like a basket case. There was a very, oh, cheap and weird 
old horror movie called Basket Case. I only saw the first one. I don't think I ever saw the sequel. Um, but if you want old crappy horror movies, go find Basket Case. It's enjoyable. Uh, all right, now we have Basket Catch. It is two words, noun from 1964. A catch of a fly ball made with a glove held palm up at waist level. Next is, now I'm trying to figure out if this is going to be the last word. I think it is. Okay, this is the last word for this episode. Basketful, B-A-S-K-E-T-F-U-L. It is a noun from the 14th century. As much or as many as a basket will hold. Also, a considerable quantity. Uh, Okay, so what is going to be the word of the episode? I should probably think about this while I'm reading them, but I I spend so much brain energy reading the words uh, that I have a hard time. I'm going to pick basket case uh, as the word of the episode because I was blown away by a person who has all four limbs amputated. It's called a basket case. Am I... Am I making up the fact that I that is weird or that I've never heard of that before? I don't know. Anyway, uh, don't celebrate the Ides of March by stabbing somebody in the back. Thank you. Um, so this has been Spencer dispensing all the knowledge and the information into your brains. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of this dictionary podcast that you have somehow found and somehow have decided to listen to it. I hope if you are new, you listen through the whole episode. Go to the beginning, though. Go to episode A1. They're all free. Start from there. It's much more fun that way. Uh, If you want to contact me, all of the episode information should be in the description. If it's not, I guess you're screwed. No. Uh, Email address, I think, is just dictionarypod at gmail.com. Twitter is at dictionarypod. Instagram is probably the same. You can find me. Just look up the dictionary. Uh, Somehow you found this, so you're smart. Uh, I got a Google Voice. I got a, if you want to leave a voicemail, I got a Patreon. If you feel like you got a few bucks to spare every month, you know, give it to me and I'll give you some early episodes and exclusive episodes. Um, okay, what are the words today? Oh, I think it's my cousin's birthday today. Happy birthday. Okay, first word is basket hilt. B-A-S-K-E-T. Second word, hilt. H-I-L-T. It is a noun from circa 1550. A hilt with a basket-shaped guard to protect the hand. Basket hilted with a hyphen is an adjective. Next is basket maker. Two words, the first letter in each, are capitalized. This is a noun from 1897. Any of three stages of an ancient culture of the plateau area of southwestern U.S. Also, a member of the people who produced the basket maker culture. I had no idea that they had like a a specific culture uh, that had to be capitalized. That's cool. Uh, Now we have basket of gold. Three words. There are hyphens. It is a noun from circa 1889. A European perennial herb of the mustard family widely cultivated for its grayish foliage and yellow flowers. The scientific name is, well, there's two of them, Arinia sexatilis. And it also says, uh, well, it says S-Y-N. I don't know if that's a synonym or just another, another version of it. Um, is alissum sexatile. All right, next we have basketry. It is a noun from 1851. Number one, synonym is basket work. Number two, the art or craft of making baskets or objects woven like baskets. Next is basket star, noun from circa 1902. Any of various brittle stars with slender, complexly branched interlacing arms. Next is basket weave, Two words, noun from 1897, a textile weave resembling the checkered pattern of a plated basket. Plated is P-L-A-I-T-E-D. Also, something resembling this weave. I don't know how it happened, but for some reason, basket weaving became the sort of joke, something like, 
when you're talking about college classes, basket weaving is, it seems to be the one that always comes up. Why, why, why is basket weaving the joke class that people talk about? Uh, can't people get a little bit more creative? Um, also, for some reason, underwater, it, it becomes underwater basket weaving. Is that so insane? I mean, yes, it is insane. But I don't know. It just seems funny that that's become the standard. I think we need other options for really ridiculous college classes that don't exist. Okay, now we have basket work. It is one word. It is a noun from 1665. Objects produced by basketry. And that just reminds me of the um, the episode of the TV show, uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, called Charlie Work. It's probably my favorite episode. It's very adult. Oh, the whole show is very adult, so you kids shouldn't go watch it. Um, but you should, and don't tell your parents that I said you should. Uh, it's very funny and well done. Next is Basking Shark. Two words, noun from circa 1769, a large plankton feeding shark that has an oil rich liver and may attain a length of up to 45 feet. What? 45 feet, which is 13.7 meters. The scientific name is Setor- Setorhinus Maximus. Setorhinus Maximus. Now we have Basmati rice. It is two words. Noun from 1845, a cultivated aromatic long grain rice originating in southern Asia, called also basmati. This is a Hindi word, basmati, which means kind of rice. So, wait, but literally means something fragrant. Or is it just saying that basmati is a kind of rice and it literally means something fragrant? I don't know. So, I guess basmati rice is fragrant rice, essentially. By the way, I am still blown away at how large a basking shark can get up to 45 feet. I mean, that's really huge. Okay, now we have bas mitzvah, B-A-S, next word, M-I-T-Z-V-A-H. It is often capitalized. What does the B and M mean in the abbreviations? Um, Or is it just abbreviated as B and M? That seems weird. Okay. Uh, let's see, bas mitzvah. I do hear people say this every once in a while. It is a variation of bat mitzvah. So earlier, we had bar mitzvah, um, which I think was for the boy. Is that right? Um, and then bat mitzvah is for the girl. Uh, where Where is that in this book? Um, oh, yeah, it's one, two, three, four. It's like five or six episodes from now. Um, but anyway, sometimes they say bas mitzvah instead. Uh, Okay, now we have basophil, B-A-S-O-P-H-I-L. It is a noun from circa 1890, a basophilic substance or structure, especially a white blood cell containing basophilic granules that is similar in function to a mast cell. I don't know my cell stuff, but that's about cells. Now we have basophilia. It is a noun from 1905, one Tendency to stain with basic dyes, D-Y-E-S. Number two, an abnormal condition in which some tissue element has increased basophilia. Now we have basophilic, adjective from circa 1894, staining readily with basic stains. Now we have basotho, capital B-A-S-O-T-H-O. It is a noun from... 1895, a Bantu-speaking people of Lesotho, also a member of these people. So the the people are no, that's the people. Wait, so Les, Lesotho is so it's the Basotho people in Lesotho. Uh, so this is is it saying a Sotho word, which is plural of Mosotho, which is a Basotho person from the prefix Mo, which is plus and the class prefix plus the suffix sotho, perhaps an alternative of motho, which means human being. Oh, this is so interesting. And they all end in sotho. God, there's really a lot that I don't know out there. I didn't totally understand all that I just read, but I found it really interesting and cool. Okay, now we have Basque, capital B-A-S-Q-U-E. It is a noun from 1667, one a member of a people inhabiting the Western Pyrenees or Pyrenees 
on the Bay of Biscay. I feel like I should know how to say this word. Pyrenees? P-Y-R-E-N-E-E-S. I know I've heard it and I've said it, but for some reason I'm not. it's not working out in my brain right now. Pyrenees. Maybe that's what it is. Number two, the language of the Basques of unknown relationship. Number three is not capitalized. A tight-fitting bodice for women. Basque is also an adjective. Uh, This is French from Middle French, ultimately from the Latin Vasco, which is a member of a group of ancient peoples inhabiting the present Basque country. There's a country called Basque? Okay. Um, Now we have the last word for this episode. It is Bas Relief. B-A-S hyphen R-E-L-I-E-F. It is a noun from 1667, uh, which is the same year as the last word. I wonder if there's a if if that's connected. Sculptural sculpt yeah sculptural relief in which the projection from the surrounding surface is slight, and no part of the modeled form is undercut. Also, sculpture executed in bas relief. I'll see if I can find a picture of this because I think for things like this, it helps when you have a visual uh, representation. Um, I might not post it right away, um, so you might have to wait a few days to actually see this on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, but I will really, really, really try to do it. Uh, Let's see. So the etymology says this is French from bas, which means low, plus relief, which means raised work. So it's kind of interesting, at least in my brain, how those those are sort of opposites. Low and then raised raised work. It, in my mind, I'm thinking like it's up, it's high. Um, but, uh, you know, it's probably more... I'm, I'm probably thinking about it all wrong. Uh, yeah. Anyway, what is the word of the episode? There was one... Um, well, I'm going to pick basotho as the word of the episode because... I just felt like I learned a little bit more about something that I know absolutely nothing about. Um, and I also like the fact that all those words ended in Soto. Uh, that is it for this episode. Um, oh, yeah. Go rate and review this. Um, you know, a lot of podcasts tell you to do that, especially on Apple Podcasts, because it actually does help if you get higher ratings. It gets the exposure out there, which, of course, I want everybody to know about this podcast. And if you don't, that's okay too. Um, Yeah, thank you. I have been dispensing you information, and my name is Spencer. Thank you, and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this episode of the most amazing podcast called The Dictionary, the only podcast in the world where somebody is reading the entire dictionary that I'm aware of. It is me. I uh, I have a monopoly on this thing. First word is bass, B A S S. Well, I just ran I just read through all the words for this episode and now that word sounds really really weird. Is it bass? Yeah, it's bass. Uh, it is the first form. It is a noun from before the 12th century. Any of numerous edible marine or freshwater bony fishes. Uh, that's the end of that sentence. I don't understand. I've seen this before. Why do they have to put in the word edible? Um I guess technically there are things in the sea that are not edible by humans, but it seems odd that you have to say it. Are they just saying that because people do eat them? Well, people eat a lot of things, but that doesn't mean they're technically edible. I mean, I don't know, whatever. I'm not getting into that conversation. This is Middle English bass or bears from Old English bears akin to the Old High German bersich, which means perch. Uh, the scientific family names are Centrarchidae, Seranidae, and Persichthyidae, of the order Persiformes or Persiformes. Yeah, those are all real words. Now we have base. So this is the second form of the word that's spelled the same way, but it's pronounced base. It is an adjective from. Uh, The 15th century, one, deep or grave in tone, 2A, of low pitch, 2B, that was of low pitch, by the way, 2B, relating to or having the range or part of a bass, so this is Middle English, bass or bass, spelled B-A-S, 
which means base, B-A-S-E. And there's more at the word base. Uh, and to be honest, I never really thought about the fact that, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of like a bass guitar, which will, I think we'll get to maybe, maybe not. Um, I, I specifically thinking about that or just like the um, uh, bass singing, that that level, that um, brain is broken, uh, the low pitch. Um, I never really thought about the fact that it is holding down the bass. It is the bass of the music. Um, why did I never think about that? Uh, all right, now we have the third form. Uh, this one is pronounced bass. It is a noun from the 15th century. Um, okay, so this is probably more of like the guitar thing and stuff. Uh, it's because the other one was an adjective. So this is uh, 1A, the lowest voice part in a four-part chorus. 1B, the lower half of the whole vocal or instrumental tonal range compared to the word treble. 1C, the lowest adult male singing voice, also a person having this voice. Are there any women that have bass voices? I don't know. It probably seems super rare, but there must be somebody out there. 1D, a member of a family of instruments having the lowest range, especially the synonym double bass. Number two, a deep or grave tone, a low-pitched sound. I wish I had a lower-pitched voice. This isn't good enough for me. Now we have bass again. It is the fourth form of this word. It is a noun from 1691. Number one is the number one definition for bass wood, which we will read later this episode. Number two, a coarse, tough fiber from palms. This is an alternative of BAST, B-A-S-T, which we will also be reading later this episode. And one of the synonyms is one of my favorite words that I learned recently. All right, next is bass clef. Two words, noun from circa 1771. All you music people already know this one. Number one, a clef facing the F below middle C on the fourth line of the staff. Number two, the bass staff. Now we have bass drum. It is two words, noun from 1804. A large drum having two heads and giving a booming sound of low indefinite pitch. And then it tells me to see the drum illustration. Sweet, there's a drum illustration? I can't wait. Bah. Now we have basset hound. Two words, noun from 1883. Any of an old breed of short-legged hunting dogs of French origin having very long ears and a short, smooth coat called also basset. I think you all know what a basset hound look like. What a basset hound looks like, but maybe I'll post a picture. Uh, this is French, basset, from Middle French, from basset, which means short. Oh, that's why they're called basset hounds. From bass, which means low, and there's more at the word base. So basset hounds are bassets because they're low to the ground. They got usually got short legs. Yep, usually it says short-legged. Now we have bass fiddle, two words, noun, from 1836, and we have the synonym double bass. I once had a dream that I, I saw a bass, you know, one of those like upright basses that look like a huge violin, and uh, it was lo almost cartoony shaped. It was like really wide for some reason, and I think it only had three strings. And later I found out that there actually is, I think, a three-stringed bass that's like bigger than the normal basses you see in an orchestra, but it wasn't like wide and cartoony shaped. But I think the one that I saw in my dream was like 10 feet tall or something insane. It was it was ridiculous. Okay, next we have a bass horn. Two words, noun from circa 1825. An obsolete wind instrument shaped like a bassoon, but with a cup-shaped mouthpiece. Let's try and find a picture. Now we have bassinet. It is a noun from 1854. A baby's basket-like bed, as of wicker work or plastic, often with a hood over one end. This is probably modified from the uh, French barcolonnette, uh, which is a diminutive of berco, which means cradle. Now we have bassist. It is a noun from circa 1909. A person who plays an acoustic or electric bass. There was a time in my life where I thought I was going to learn how to get a uh, how to play bass and i was going to buy a bass 
but I didn't. Probably better that way, but I do love them. Uh, all right, next we have Basso, bass with an O at the end. It is a noun from circa 1724. One, a bass singer, especially an operatic or operatic bass. Number two, a low, deep voice. This is Italian from Middle Latin bassus or bassus from bassus, but that's the same word, which means short or low. Now we have bassoon. It is a noun from 1724, a double reed woodwind instrument having a long U-shaped conical tube connected to the mouthpiece by a thin metal tube and a usual range two octaves lower than that of the oboe. Bassoonist is a noun. And uh, I've always really, really wanted to try to play a bassoon, especially a contra bassoon. That thing's even bigger. Um... I tried an oboe once, uh, and I think I did okay. I played the saxophone, which is a single reed instrument, so the oboe is, you know, it's a, a kind of a different beast uh, because it's got a totally different reed system. It's a double reed, and it's smaller. Um, but uh, I think I did okay considering that, and um, the bassoon is awesome. A lot of people maybe don't really like the sound of it, but I do. Um, why? Why is... The bassoon, why does it have such a different name than the oboe? Are they, is it, is it a, a larger version of an oboe or are they just different things? Like there's, you know, there's different versions of the saxophone, contrabass, bass, uh, baritone, tenor, alto, soprano, sopranino, or no, sopra, soprano, yeah, I think soprano and then sopranissimo, I think there's one of those. Um, same with the clarinet. There's a regular clarinet and there's the bass clarinet. Uh, alto, uh, is there an alto clarinet? Ba- um, crap. Contra alto, contra bass. I think there might be an octa contra bass or something. But what's the deal with bassoon and oboe? That was my whole point. All right, now we have basso profundo. Two words. Uh, let's see, 18... Noun from 1853, a deep, heavy bass voice with an exceptionally low range. Also, a person having this voice. This is Italian, and it literally means deep bass. I feel like I should uh, pitch shift all of these in uh, when I'm editing this to make it very, very low. Uh, now we have basso relievo. There's a hyphen. It is a noun from circa 19... No, 1639... And we just have the synonym bas relief, which we had in the last episode. And this, I'm looking at the etymology. I, we can skip it. Now we have bass viol, V I O L, two words, noun from 1590. Number one, we just have the synonym viola da gamba. And number two, synonym is double bass. Now we have basswood. One word, noun from 1670. One, any of several New World Lindens, especially the 1B definition for Linden. I don't know what a Linden is, but my grandparents uh, lived in Lindenhurst. My grandpa is still there. Um, so it must be maybe a sort of tree or wood or something. Number two, the straight grained soft white wood of a basswood. Now we have bast, B-A-S-T. It is a noun from before the 12th century. One is the wonderful synonym phloem, P-H-L-O-E-M. Number two synonym is bast fiber, two words. Now we have two forms of our last word. It is bastard. A lot of people would call this a swear word. I wouldn't call this a swear word, Um, but uh, it's a good word. It's fun to use. The first form, it, oh, it's spelled B-A-S-T-A-R-D, in case you're curious. It is a noun from the 14th century. One, an illegitimate child. Number two, something that is spurious, irregular, inferior, or of questionable origin. Of course, in Game of Thrones, they say this word a lot. Number three, A, an offensive or disagreeable person used as a generalized term of abuse. 3B, synonym is man or fellow. Bastardly is an adjective. Uh, This is Middle English from Anglo-French, probably of Germanic origin, akin to the old... What is that word? Hold on. Uh, Old, 
old old Phrygian. F R I S I A N. Phrygian or Frisian? I don't know what that is. That's an old language. Akin to the old Frisian word bost, B O S T, which means marriage, and old English bindon, which means to bind. Now we have the second form of bastard. This is the last one. It is an adjective from the 14th century. One synonym is illegitimate. Number two, of mixed or well, no, of mixed or ill-conceived origin. Synonym is known for coining bastard, no. Did I say synonym? I meant as in known for coining bastard words. Number three, of abnormal shape or irregular size. Number four, of a kind similar, oh, sorry, let me try that again, of a kind similar to, but inferior to, or less typical than some standard. And number five, lacking genuineness or authority. Synonym is false. Uh, Okay, that was all of the words. I actually really liked a lot of these, so this is kind of hard to pick, but I think I am going to pick bassoon as the word of the episode uh bastard was probably a close second um and so was bast because one of the synonyms was phloem uh let's see today oh you know what i gotta say happy first date anniversary to my wife nine years ago we had our first date it's also saint patrick's day way less important um so i guess go go celebrate it but be smart about it um don't get too drunk um don't yeah you know just just have fun be respectful the american way of celebrating saint saint patrick's day is i think pretty different from the uh the typical irish way that they celebrate it uh we are not so respectful of their culture and what oh and then i was gonna say also um because i haven't said this for a while my wife has a podcast too uh what a good day to to mention it um kids turn off your ears uh, it is a podcast where her and her friend, uh, I also throw my voice in there every once in a while, they mostly talk about horror movies, uh, but they also talk about the paranormal and uh, true crime, serial killers. Uh, David Lynch comes up every once in a while. Uh, he'll come up more, I know. Um, and just some other fun, creepy stuff. They have a really good time uh, making this podcast. I'm their producer, engineer, editor, and uh, yeah. It's called Whores Talk Horror. I'll put the link in. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. I have been Spencer Dispensing Information. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is the podcast where I tell you things that are in the dictionary. You might learn something. In fact, it's almost guaranteed that you will learn something. I am recording this mere minutes after eating a couple of small, small bowls of chili at work. Today is the chili cook-off, which we do every year, and it is a grand old time. It is one of the favorite days here at work. Uh, There's eight chilies, I think. Two of them are vegan, which I was able to try. So thank you to you two folks who made the vegan chili, if you're listening. And I voted for my favorite. They were both really good, though. Um, okay, let's talk about some words. First word is bastardize, B-A-S-T-A-R-D-I-S-E. Let's turn down my headphones. That's too much. So this is the British variation of bastardize that ends in a Z-E, which is our next word. Uh, Bastardize, the first one was at the bottom of page 102. Now we are at the top of page 103. Bastardize with a Z is a verb from 1587. One, to reduce from a higher to a lower state or condition. Synonym is debase. Number two, to declare or prove to be a bastard. Number three, to modify, especially by introducing discordant or disparate elements. Bastardization is a noun, uh, and I should have mentioned this was a transitive verb. Now we have bastard wing, two words, noun from 1772, and the synonym is maybe a sneeze, maybe not, it'll come later. The synonym is alula, that's a palindrome, A-L-U-L-A, alula. You know what, it's actually a phonetic palindrome as well, because if I say alula, I can play it backwards like alula, and it should sound similar, I think. Okay, next we have 
Bastardy. Bastard with a Y. It is a noun from the 15th century. One, the quality or state of being a bastard. Number two, the begetting of an illegitimate child. Now we have based. It is the first form. Transitive verb from fifteenth from the 15th century. I don't want to speak bad. To sew with long, loose stitches in order to hold something in place temporarily. Uh, baster is a noun. This is, I think I said it's a transitive verb. Uh, Middle English from Middle French bastir, from, or of Germanic origin, akin to the Old High German besten, which means to patch, from Old English based, B-A-E-S-T, which means bast, B-A-S-T, uh, which I guess we read before. Sorry I got the sniffles, probably because uh, the chili had a little bit of a kick to it, which I enjoyed. Now we have the second form of baste. It is a transitive verb from the 15th century. To moisten, as meat, at intervals with a liquid, as melted butter, fat, or pan drippings, especially during cooking. Baster is a noun. Now we have the third form of baste. It is also a transitive verb from 1533. One, to beat severely or soundly. Synonym is thrash. Number two, to scold vigorously. Synonym is berate. Uh, this is probably from the Old Norse besta, akin to the Old English biaton, to which means to beat. Now we have bast fiber. Two words, noun from 1852. A strong woody fiber obtained chiefly from the phloem, oh, there's that word again, phloem of plants and used especially in cordage, matting, and fabrics. Now we have bastille, noun from 1741. The etymology takes up mm, the whole thing, practically. Uh, We just have the synonyms prison and jail. So this is French Bastille from the Bastille with a capital B, which is a fortress in Paris from Middle French uh, Bastille, modified of Old Occitan or Occitan Bastida, which means fortified town, from Bastille, which means to build, uh, of Germanic origin akin to the Old High German Besten, which means to patch. So our words based and Bastille are related etymologically. Now we have Bastille Day. It is two words, and the first letters are capitalized. (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, And I need to figure out where I'm going to end this episode. I think I'll do it right there. Okay, Bastille Day is a noun from 1837. July 14th, observed in France as a national holiday in commemoration of the fall of the Bastille in 1789. You all remember that day, don't you? Now we have bastinado, B-A-S-T-I-N-A-D-O. It is the first form, and it is a, where's the, where did the thing go? Uh, Oh, it's a noun from 1572. One, a blow with a stick or cudgel. Two, A, a beating, especially with a stick. Two, B, a punishment consisting of beating the soles of the feet with a stick. And number three, we have these synonyms stick and cudgel. Uh, Let's see. This is, uh, there is so much extra information on this one. It could be bastinado, could be bastinade. Uh, This is Spanish, bastinado, uh, bastonada, which is from baston, which means stick, from Latin bastum. Now we have bastinado again. It is the second form. This one is a transitive verb from 1599, to subject to repeated blows. Now we have the word basting. It is the first form of three. This first one is a noun from the 15th century. Uh, One, the action of a sewer. Oh, sewer. Ah, I think that word is spelled the same way, isn't it? Sewer and sower. One who sews or the thing where your poop goes. That is a song. The action of a sower who bastes. And of course, if you remember from earlier in this episode, uh, the number one, the first form of baste is about sowing. 
Uh, okay, so 2A definition for the word basting is the thread used in basting. And 2B, the stitching made by basting. So when you're basting, you make a basting made with basting, and you are a baster who is basting. Oh, my God. All right, now we have the second form of basting. It is a noun from the uh, the year 1530. The year was 1530. The word basting had just been invented. Number one, the action of one that bastes food. Number two, the liquid used in basting. I feel like there's some sort of way that we could combine these two versions of this word, sewing and cooking. Is there some funny comic we could make? I don't know. Now we have the third form of basting. It is a noun from circa 1616, a severe beating. Oh, we, we could throw in that one too. You're, you're beating the chicken out of the oven with a sewing needle? I don't know. Now we have bastion. It is a noun from 1562. One, a projecting part of a fortification. Number two, a fortified area or position. Number three, we have the number two definition for the word stronghold, as in the last bastion of academic standards. And that is from American Scientist. I'm assuming that's uh, some sort of magazine or journal or something like that. Bastioned uh, is an adjective. This is uh, Middle French from Old Italian, bastione, which is an augmented form of bastia, which means fortress or derivative from the dialect form of bastire, which means to build, of Germanic origin, akin to the Old High German besten, which means to patch. Now we have basuto. I think it's that's how it's pronounced. It is with a capital B, A-S-U-T-O. It is a noun from 1834, and we just have the synonym basotho, which we read recently. Um, I was actually just listening to that episode not too long ago. Uh, yeah, that is the one with the, uh, the language, the Bantu-speaking people of Lesotho. Uh, basuto, that's that one. And now the last word for this episode. Um, I could probably save this for the next one, but I'm just going to read it here. It is the first form of the word bat, B-A-T. It is a noun from before the 12th century. One, a stout, solid stick. Synonym is club. Number two, a sharp blow. Synonym is stroke. 3A, a usually wooden implement used for hitting the ball in various games. 3B, a paddle used in various games as table tennis. I love table tennis. 3C, the short whip used by a jockey. 4A, synonyms are batsman and batter, as in a right-handed bat. Well, okay. Uh, now we have, what, 4B, a turn at batting, usually used in the phrase at bat. 4C, hitting, oh, hitting ability. That's the definition, as in we need his bat in the lineup. 5. Synonym is bat with two T's. Interesting. Uh, Number 6 is British. Uh, The definition is rate of speed. And the synonym is gait. G-A-I-T. So whenever you hear people talk about an animal's gait or something, uh, they often talk about that in, uh, what, like the dog shows? Uh, That's that's what that's about. Uh, Number 7. Synonym is binge. B-I-N-G-E. We have a phrase, it is off one's own bat, uh, that is chiefly British, and it means through one's own efforts. We have another phrase, off the bat, and that means without delay. Synonym is immediately, or sometimes I like to say immediately, as in recognized him right off the bat. Uh, Let's see. Well, this is from the old English word bat with two T's. Uh, So we'll get to learn all about that in a number of episodes. Um, So that is all the words for today. And I need to pick a word of the episode. Um, I don't know. Well, I'm going to pick bastard wing uh, because I don't know what that is. And I also didn't know what the synonym is, Alula. So I'm still confused. Although I must have read Alula a while ago. Oh, I guess I have to go look that up. 
Uh, so that is all the words. Let's uh, let's talk about some personal stuff now. Any of you who don't care can turn me off. I don't think there's any holidays today. Uh, voting has been going on a lot. You got to go vote, please, and thank you. Um, you know, it's happening. Um, let's see. Uh, what was I going to say? Um, it's been a little while since I recorded, so it's hard to remember like all the stuff that has happened since then. Um I went and I saw that movie Onward. Oh, yeah, those are all the things I could talk about. Yeah, sorry. This is a little bit about my personal life, this podcast. Um, And like I said, if you don't like that, you can turn it off. I saw Onward. I really liked it. Uh, They also had a trailer for the movie Soul, which I had mentioned before. And I didn't know anything about it. And then I saw the trailer and it really hit me at... um, it, It just... It struck me. It spoke to me. And I am not embarrassed to say uh, I cried at the trailer. Um, Like I said, it just uh, struck me at a certain moment in my life. And I'm really, really excited to see this movie, which I think comes out this summer. Um, I saw They Might Be Giants on uh, the 6th uh, in Chicago, and that was great. And then I saw them again the next night at Geek Bowl. My team and I, I think... First of all, I have to say, I am super impressed with my team, Uh, especially a couple of them. They were pulling answers out of who knows where at such ridiculous speed. Uh, Andrew, PJ, Joe, you guys killed it. Uh, Of course, Mindy and Sharon, you guys were amazing too. I was absolutely the weak link in that chain. Um, But I was really impressed with all of you. And... uh, we still did terrible. Uh, we were 194 out of 233, or maybe more teams. I'm not sure. Um, I, I didn't expect us to win, uh, you know, but we had a really good, great time. It was awesome to hang out with my friends and uh, and just, just have fun. Um, so I think that is mostly it for now. There's probably more stuff I could say, but maybe I can hold that for later. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. This has been Spencer dispensing information into your brain. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. I am going to start with some words. First word is bat, B-A-T, second form of transitive verb. No, see, it's just a regular verb. Oh, I see. I missed the VB there. Uh, So this is a verb from the 13th century. We are going to start with the transitive definitions. Number one, to strike or hit with or as if with a bat. To A, to advance a base runner by batting. To B, to have a batting average of. Number three, to discuss at length, colon, consider in detail. Now we have the intransitive definitions. 1A, to strike or hit a ball with a bat. 1B, to take one's turn at bat. 2, to wander aimlessly. Now we have the third form of bat. It is a noun from 1580. This looks more interesting. Any of a widely distributed order of nocturnal, usually frugivorous or insectivorous flying mammals that have wings formed from four elongated digits of the forelimb covered by a cutaneous membrane and that have adequate visual capabilities but often rely on echolocation. A wonderfully specific definition of the animal bat. Uh, so let's see, the the order, the scientific order is Chiroptera, C-H-I-R-O-P-T-E-R-A, Chiroptera. Uh, let's see, frugivorous, I think, means that they eat fruit, and insectivorous means that they eat insects. Um, so, and I, I always, when I learned this, I thought this the, that this was amazing. Their wings are not like the wings of a bird. Uh, Their wings are their arms and fingers. I mean, I guess technically the wings of a bird are their arms, but they don't have fingers. They just have they just have wings. Um, Bats. The the first part um, is kind of like a little arm, I think. But then the rest of it is literally their fingers that spread out with uh, this membrane in the middle, um, which is just very cool. Um, So what else was I going to say? Uh, then the etymology is, uh, it's probably an alternative of the Middle English Bach, B-A-K-K-E, which is of Scandinavian origin. It is akin to the old, is this old Swedish? I think I really need to make a permanent marker of where this page is. 
Um, old Swedish. Uh, old Swedish not baka, which means bat. Now this is interesting because not baka looks like it's one word, but the baka is in b a k k a is in italics, and the not n a t t is not in italics. Uh, is old Swedish not? Is that a different uh, abbreviation? No, I don't think so. Uh, so I don't know what that is. We are going to move on to the fourth form of bat. This is a transitive verb from circa 1787. To wink, especially in surprise or emotion, as in never batted an eye. Also, the synonym flutter, as in batted his eyelashes. Uh, Interesting example. I appreciate that uh, they put uh, a male um, batting his eyelashes, but... Stereotypically, it's often a female who bats their eyelashes, but like I said, um, yeah, let's mix it up. It doesn't have to be a female who bats their eyelashes. Uh, This is probably an alternative of the second form of the word bait, B-A-T-E, which is uh, coming up in this episode. Uh, So don't go anywhere. Now we have B-A-T, all caps. This is an abbreviation for Bachelor of Arts in Teaching. Now we have bat boy, one word, Noun from 1897, a boy employed to look after the equipment as bats of a baseball team. And uh, there's probably some bat girls out there, I would assume. Um, Are we even going to see? Yep, yep, we'll see a bat girl later. Uh, Now we have the word batch, B-A-T-C-H. It is the first form. Noun from the, the 15th century. One, the quantity baked at one time. Synonym is baking. 2A, the quantity of material prepared or required for one operation. Specifically, a mixture of raw materials ready for fusion into glass. 2B, the quantity produced at one operation. 2C, a group of jobs as programs that are submitted for processing on a computer and whose results are obtained at a later time, as in batch processing. I've played around with this a little bit, like in uh, Photoshop or Illustrator. There's other programs that do it too. That's Those are the only ones that I've used it in, where if you want to do sort of the same action on a bunch of images, like when I was doing rotoscope animation, I had a bunch of images and I needed to do the same thing, like create later, save it out as this file, blah, blah, blah. And there's hundreds of images. So you just tell the program, do these things, blah, blah, blah. It's super easy. And then it just runs the batch. Uh, And then at the end of that uh, 2C definition, it just says, compare to the synonym time sharing. Number three, a quantity, as of persons or things, considered as a group. Uh, This is from Middle English, bach or botch, B-A-C-H-E, which is akin to the Old English bakan, which means to bake. Now we have the second form of batch. It is a transitive verb from 1863, to bring together or process as a batch. And batcher is a noun. Third form of batch. It is a variation of the word bach or botch, B-A-C-H. And, uh, well, I mean, I know bach as in the composer, but I really don't remember what B-A-C-H is. So if you want to go learn that again, go back. Now we have the first form of bait, B-A-T-E. It is a verb from the 14th century. The transitive definitions are first. One, To reduce the force or intensity of, synonym is restrain, as in with bated breath. Number two, to take away, synonym is deduct. Number three is archaic, to lower, especially in amount or estimation. Number four is also archaic. We have the synonym blunt. Now, we have just the one intransitive definition. It is obsolete, and we just have two synonyms, diminish and decrease. Oh, I just remembered um, I took a lift home, I think it was uh, just a few days ago, um, and um, he um, he was a guy who came from, I think it was either Venezuela or Brazil, Sorry, I feel terrible that I don't remember which country he was from. But he's been in America for a few years, and um, he's on a work visa, and he's been taking ESL classes. And I said, 
I this might sound weird, but I have a podcast where I talk about the dictionary. I read the dictionary, and I've always thought that this might be useful for people who are learning English as a second language. Um, so I, I mentioned it to him. He looked it up. Um, I don't know if he's listening, but hey, if you're listening, I think uh, his name was Moises. Uh, if you're listening, I hope you're, you are enjoying this. And if you're listening to this uh, close to when the time this episode airs, I urge you to go all the way back to the first episode and uh, listen from there. Um, and, you know, if there's any other people out there who are listening to this podcast as uh, sort of an ESL lesson, uh, A, I am not a credited class. You can't get credit for this. Uh, but I hope that it's enjoyable and I hope that it's teaching you something. Uh, or if you know anybody who might get some use out of this, uh, you know, tell them about it. I, I just It just popped in my head, so I had to tell you. All right, now we have the second form of bait. It is an intransitive verb from the 14th century. So in italics, it says, of a falcon or hawk. And the definition is, to attempt to fly off something as a gauntlet in fear. To attempt to fly off something in fear. And then, uh, as a gauntlet. So it could be flying off a gauntlet, which I guess is the thing that goes on the hand. Again, I think I mentioned this before. I always thought the gauntlet was something else, but I think that's right. So weird. Uh, all right, this is Middle English from Middle French, batre, which means to beat, and uh, that is from Latin, batuere. I don't know what it means, though. Maybe to beat. Now we have bat-eared fox. It is two words, but the bat-eared is hyphenated. Uh, this is a noun from 1930. A large-eared, yellowish-gray fox that inhabits arid, unforested areas of eastern and southern Africa. And the scientific name for this large-eared, yellowish-gray fox is Otocyon megalotis. Uh, O-T-O-C-Y-O-N, second word, mega, L-O-T-I-S. Now we have the word, is it bateau? I think it's bateau. B-A-T-E-A-U. Uh, there could also be a double T. And there could also be an X at the end. Uh, so there's four different ways. Oh, I guess with an X, uh, that would be pl the plural form of bateau. Uh, so this is a noun from 1711. Any of various small craft, especially a flat-bottomed boat with raked bow and stern and flaring sides. This is Canadian French from French from Old French, batel from Old English, bat which means boat, and there's more at the word boat. Now we have bait, Batesian. Yeah, I thought it was Batesian because that's how it's spelled, but it is Batesian, capital B-A-T-E-S-I-A-N. It's like, um, well, it's named after a guy, Bates, so that's why, that's why it sounds Batesian. Uh, it is an adjective from 1895, characterized by or being mimicry, involving resemblance of an innocuous species to another that is protected from predators by repellent qualities as unpalpability, as in a Batesian mimic. I'm still a little bit confused. Um, I guess characterized by resemblance of an innocuous species to another. So it's basically like um, camouflage, right? Is that what I'm understanding? I don't know. My brain is broken. So this is from Henry Walter Bates, who died in 1892, uh, and he was an English naturalist. Uh, so this was coined three years after he died, it looks like. Now we have batfish, all one word, noun from 1808. Any of several fishes with wing-like processes, especially any of a family of flattened Pediculate bony fishes. The family name is Agacephalidae of the order Lophiformes. Oh my god. I know some of you are smacking your thing. Um, so the first word is O G C O C E P H A L I D A E. Ogcophilidae. And the order is L O P H I I. F-O-R-M-E-S. That's partly why I got confused, because of the double I. Lophiformes. So that's a bat fish. Now we have bat fowl. It is a, uh, an intransitive verb from the 15th century. 
to catch birds at night by bind, uh, blinding them with a light and knocking them down with a stick or netting them. That process is called bat fowl. Uh, by the way, it is spelled B A T F O W L. So fowl is like the bird, uh, or birds are fowl. Uh, to catch birds at night by blinding them. Interesting. Um, I guess people do that with bats too. They they um. I don't know if they blind them, but they try and catch them with a, a stick or a net or something when they're in their house. Uh, so would that be called foul bat? Probably not. Last word for this episode is bat girl. Two words. Noun from 1937. A girl or woman employed to look after the equipment as bats of a baseball team. Uh, so it's the same definition as bat boy, but bat boy is one words and bat girl is two words. And uh, Bat Boy is just a boy, not a boy or a man. And Bat Girl is a girl or a woman. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of sexist. You're going to call a woman a girl. Uh, you could at least call her a Bat Woman. Um, are there ever Bat Men who you would call a Bat Boy? Right? You probably wouldn't do that. So, why? Uh, okay. Um, so I think I am going to pick Batesian as the word of the episode, um, because it sounds similar to camouflage. Maybe later when I'm listening back to this, I'll understand it better. Um, there were some good ones in here though. Uh, I'll have to see if I can post pictures of the, uh, the various nouns like bat and bat-eared fox and bat fish and all that. Uh, Okay. Oh, today, I think, is the, uh, you could call it the March, what was it, the March Equinox? Um, we did just have Daylight Savings Time. I think I talked about that. Uh, yeah, March Equinox, I think it's also called the Vernal Equinox, um, where the amount of light is, uh, the, the amount of day and night are equivalent, uh, which means that our days are getting longer here in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, your days are getting shorter. Uh, I think that's all I got to say. I thought I had something else, but that is it. Maybe I'll remember later. Probably not. Thank you very much for listening. This has been Spencer dispensing information into your brains. Thank you and goodbye.